everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore coming at you from Breckenridge, Colorado. Today on the show, we have an amazing guest, Cody from the River Sticks Foundation. The River Sticks Foundation has been donating a whole bunch of money strategically in the psychedelic world for a while now. And some of you might recall the name. Some of you probably is the first time you're hearing about it. But I've been aware of them for a while, and finally, we were able to link up and have an amazing conversation. Cody is uh, living in California and has a, has a cool backstory, and we got uh, to talk about some really fun stuff and um, some sensitive stuff as well. So on this show, um, you know, trigger warning, I guess, uh, we talk about peyote and um, Native American groups access to peyote and how how troubling that situation is for the Native American church, given that um, their sacrament is still illegal to grow for the most part. I'm sure there's a couple exceptions, but there's no um, great federal protection for growing it currently for the Native American church. Um, so that's that's something that's pretty tragic and, and hopefully can be sorted out. And the River Sticks Foundation is working with um, some NAC groups and hopefully moving that forward. And we get into that more in detail in the show. It's pretty it's a pretty fun show. I hope you enjoy it. Go all over the map uh, to a degree, <laughs> and uh, and hope you like it. So if you like it, let us know. Hit us up at psychedelics today email at gmail.com or leave us a review on Facebook or iTunes. If you're wondering how to do it on, uh, on your iPhone, you click the podcast app. Um, so just type that in, a podcast, and then find Psychedelics Today in there. Scroll all the way to the bottom and you can see uh, a review button there. Facebook, it's a lot easier. It's, uh, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> or tell a friend. It would be really cool if you told a friend about Psychedelics Today. That's how we grow, and that's how we really push the movement forward is by sharing what we think is positive and helpful. So we would appreciate that. And if you're able to make a donation or, or contribute on a regular schedule, psychedelicstoday.com slash donate gives you a few options for how you could donate to us. And Patreon is great, and there's a few other options in there. So I think that's it for the intro. Thank you all for tuning in to Psychedelics Today and see you on the other side. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. Today on the show, we have Cody Swift from the River Sticks Foundation. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, happy to have you. So I've been aware of the River Sticks Foundation for a number of years, and You've always been an interesting, quiet player in the psychedelic space. Once in a while, the name comes up and I was like, wow, that's a really, really cool move the organization did. And, and nobody really makes much noise about it, which I always find interesting. But I'm glad we've got you on the show so we can kind of unpack that a little bit. So, um, Cody, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the origins of River Sticks and what and what the what the organization does? Of course, Yeah. So River Sticks, um, ostensibly, it's a it's a small family foundation, but uh, really, it's um, sort of my father and myself, and the the resources from that foundation ultimately came from my great grandfather, who was one of the first CEOs of UPS, United Parcel Service, and so my family owned a lot of stock in that company, and my grandmother, before she past, she actually put most of that into a large foundation. And I was about 22 years old coming out of college, and I started going around to those foundation meetings. And, you know, I sort of gleamed that there was something really potent and powerful in foundation capital. And, and yet, I couldn't quite Gauge and navigate all the family politics. And so actually, we advocated to pull out our quarter of that, and that became River Sticks. And so that was in about 2007. And the foundation at that point had no mission, no orientation. And so it was a complete blank slate to create whatever we wanted. And, and my father actually gave me basically full reign to develop the 
the approach. And so at 22, 23 years old, I was um, just kind of in lost territory a little bit and trying to grapple with these huge philosophical questions about how do you use a million and a half dollars a year to create the greatest change in society. And, you know, I would say it was uh, an incredible burden, but an incredible gift in that I think most people who come into philanthropy, you know, there's some remarkable young people coming in now and, and tech and, you know, my brother David Bronner and, and others. Um, but it's, it's more often that people come into philanthropy at the end of life following their careers and they're not often at the most progressive edge. You know, they're, they're in legacy mode. And, uh, and so it's, I think it's a pretty remarkable opportunity for a young person to, you know, to have progressive vision and values and some resources to, to do something about it. Yeah, that's fantastic. And did you, did you grow up in the Santa Cruz area or are you from elsewhere in the country? I actually grew up in Santa Barbara. I lived in um, Switzerland for a year in boarding school and, and spent kind of my formative uh, 10 years uh, living in Washington State and uh, in Seattle. And that's really where I sort of cut my teeth, so to speak, on drug policy reform and got connected with the ACLU of Washington very early on. And they are doing some of the most cutting edge work around criminal justice reform and you know, very early on in 2010, we helped start the LEAD initiative, a law enforcement assisted diversion. Um, we did co funding with the Ford Foundation, which was kind of the first Portugal style decrim and drug diversion, pre arrest diversion effort in the United States. And it's been hugely successful and has built this great foundation uh, with alliances with the police department and local attorneys and is actually leading to uh, an initiative that's being developed to decrim possession of all drugs in 2020 in Washington. Now, pre-arrest diversion, is that specifically in Seattle or is that kind of a statewide program? It started in actually one specific neighborhood in, in Seattle called uh, Belltown, where, which has some of the highest kind of drug arrests and sort of reoccurring kind of revolving door drug arrests for individuals. And uh, so they started there and um, working with local businesses and working very closely with the police. And um, just as a side note, I think one of the, the real kind of unexpected gifts of that program is that it actually changed the psychology of the police who were involved in that because you know the police see the problem they see it's a completely re revolving door and they they can't hold any hope for these individuals because there's no there's no outlet to even hold hope and now that they can actually take people to a place where there's services where they can actually be met in a harm reduction way you know they they actually see people not just as this hopeless you know problem that needs to be managed but actually you know, a person that can be helped. Yeah, that's huge. A lot of folks who listen to the show would, would understand immediately what you're saying by this Portugal model. Could you unpack like the Portugal model just briefly? Yeah, I just applaud Portugal mm. so much and actually learned about that um, in the early 2000s. It was Eric Schlosser's book. He wrote a book about um, kind of the underground uh, markets and he alluded to uh, to Portugal having decrimmed all drugs uh, in 2001. And I it always sat with me as kind of completely remarkable. But during that time, Portugal was facing unprecedented uh, overdose, uh, especially with heroin. And they took a radical approach, realizing they couldn't arrest their way out of the problem. So they set up a whole decriminalized approach uh, where if a person was encountered with a personal possession of drugs, they would be referred to basically a panel that had healthcare workers, nurses, social workers, and they could meet that person wherever they're at and gauge what kind of support they needed. And maybe they were well to do, you know, healthy, using drugs, say, recreationally, and didn't need support. 
and that was fine. And maybe there was someone else who actually needed some social services, housing, drug addiction treatment. And the outcome of that has been remarkable. And uh, actually, one of the, the key findings is that actually HIV, new HIV infection rates plummeted after they decriminalized. And that's because people are no longer forced to use heroin in the shadows, in the alleyways. They could bring it out into the open and treatment wasn't stigmatized. So they actually really combated uh, HIV AIDS through drug decriminalization, which is just remarkable. And it's, it's taking off in Seattle and also Vancouver. And we're, we're starting to do some work up there, actually, in some of their heroin uh, maintenance programs that they're, de- they're developing. It's extraordinary. I yeah, near zero HIV transmission rates, like compared to global standards, it's it's just extraordinarily low at this point. So wild success. Um, I see people yeah. criticize Portugal. They're like, "Do you see how poor Portugal is? It's because of this." It's like, no, the spending would have been way higher if they had to keep dealing with AIDS and arrests and the social. Um, situation in the country would have deteriorated far worse than it is at uh, the position it's in now, which, you know, Portugal is in kind of a tough spot, but not, you know, it's not Bangladesh, you know, it's still still in the EU. Um, So how is Reefer, the Reefer Madness book by Schlosser, is that like the first book you kind of dug into that kind of opened you up to this world of drug law reform or was there another kind of moment for you? Um, yeah, thanks for remembering that title of that book. I mean, Botany of Desire certainly was transformative. It's a fun book. Uh, yeah, I, I loved it. I, I really thank Michael Pollan for his early work there, too. And yeah, I, I started getting more involved kind of into psychedelic literature uh, when I was 16 and 17. But it wasn't really until after I graduated with a degree in psychology uh, as an undergrad, that I really, really started understanding the, the potential of psychedelics um, as a personal transformation tool and for understanding the mind. Yeah, that's great. It's it's nice to see more and more psychology professors willing to talk about the topic of addiction and not only that, but psychedelics. I know it's scary for professors to do that. There's a lot, there's a number of professors that listen to the show. I would just encourage you, you know, be bold perhaps point your students at least at one to two books a semester. <laughs> and it could really change the landscape of mental health care and psychological research um, over the next couple decades. Absolutely. And I, I just need to thank Michael Pollan once again. Um, I did my, uh, my graduate studies in a program in the existential phenomenological psychology. Wild. And so, I mean, really, there's no better sort of model and theoretical frame for understanding the phenomenology of psychedelics. And in that program, I was sort of championing and being a cheerleader of of psychedelic therapy back in 2011. And there wasn't a single other student that was receptive to that, Wow. nor nor the professors. It was completely stigmatized. They were sort of just locked into this talk therapy only model and um, now that Michael Pollan's book has come out they're inviting me back to my alma mater to give presentations on the subject so and their students are just you know deeply hungry hungry for for learning so it's it's really really transformed and I I like you I really hope that it enters into um, traditional psychology and um, and that more and more psychotherapists can actually have that experience because I, I've come to more firmly believe that in the psychedelic renaissance, not everyone may need to take a psychedelic. And it may be that it's the clergy and the healers and the, and the psychologists and the teachers and educators and therapists for them to have that experience. And then being embodied healers in that way, they're going to be far more effective. That healing is going to, to have an exponential benefit for the people they're working with and holding as uh, as their parishioners and students so I, you know I, I think having psychedelic reach at those levels of society and those influencers uh, is going to have a huge impact i like how you said that need <laughs> like not everybody needs it though 
not everybody should go to jail if they get their hands on some and get caught with it. And it's a, it's an interesting dichotomy that we've got to really work towards. And I'm glad you're kind of hitting all those angles. You know, we have to be, com- as psychedelic people, you become uh, often, not always, <laughs> uh, increasingly compassionate for uh, the mental health of everybody. And you see these folks with horrific addiction. And, and some folks don't necessarily dig into the next level to look at prohibition and the drug war being the real, really the biggest harm. Like heroin's kind of safe relative to the drug war. And, um, you know, fentanyl, terrifying. But if the drug war kind of went away, there, I, I would think near, near zero deaths from fentanyl overdoses. If, if the right things went into place, you know, obviously we need to spend those dollars not on tanks, but on like mental health centers and supervised injection sites with free heroin from the government like Switzerland. Like I, I, I would yeah. love to see Portugal kind of implement that to take it to the next level. But, you know, financial... <laughs> hurdles on that are pretty tremendous for a, for kind of a broke country like Portugal. Yeah, I mean, Ken Burns did a, a beautiful job sort of laying that out in the Prohibition series where moonshine was a product of um, prohibition and you know meth was a, a product of criminalizing probably cocaine and crack cocaine to such a heavy degree and now fentanyl is, you know, has emerged in uh, in in that context of you know, making opiates and especially heroin, more and more difficult. So I, I think in, in Canada, Evan Wood and his team, they're doing incredible work and actually have been able to open up heroin-assisted, heroin maintenance therapies, basically, out of response to the fentanyl crisis because they're realizing you know, people would prefer to actually have a safe supply. And as we've seen in Switzerland and uh, in Germany, people can actually lead fairly functional lives with a heroin addiction when they're not forced to, you know, commit crimes to get money to get their fix and, you know, dealing with all the, the health consequences and, yep, you got it. <laughs> it's extraordinary. And I, I would love, I would really encourage um, psychedelically inclined folks to dig deeper into this harm reduction landscape and see how much better of uh, healthcare and, and just lives folks would be living. Um, if we took this approach. Yeah, it's, you know, actually my co-director Miriam and I, we took a trip to Vancouver to the Lower East Side, East Hastings Street this summer. And, you know, it's one thing to, to know this stuff intellectually and philosophically, but then it's a whole nother to be in the thick of it there. And walking down East Hastings Street, it was completely, overwhelmingly just powerful. There's I mean, it's basically an open-air drug market. It's just like a swirling beehive of drug activity. People are just shooting up all along the street. There's crack smoke blowing in your face. And it's just, you know, it's in a way tragic, but in a way there's, uh, there's something remarkable about it being in the open. And the police not arresting people, recognizing that you know this is the safest way is to keep it in the light. And and you you start hanging around these places, and you realize this cycle of addiction. You know, at least right now, with our limited treatment options and you know the effects of kind of a broken capitalist system, that this is to some degree there's a there's an inevitability in it. So let's get real and at least provide these people safe access to a clean supply where they can start stabilizing again and and just acknowledging it's going to happen let's we can we can procure a, a safe supply and, and you know start stabilizing them and you know get them back on their feet and you know and you, and you trace that supply chain you know all the way to the poppy and you realize that bringing out in the light we could have huge huge you know, global benefits from uh, from not legalizing this, but medicalizing heroin. If you realize that the Taliban was basically funded through the illegal opium trade, you know, if we could create a channel to actually getting, um, you know, opium grown in, you know, ways that are not terrorist controlled, uh, we could have serious impact on on global terrorism by bringing opium and, and the poppy trade um, back into the open. You're familiar with Jeremy Narby? 
Cosmic Serpent, National Geographic Explorer in Residence, I think. Um, a, lo- a little bit, yeah. So he, he, wrote, um, he wrote an amazing book on DMT uh, called the, the Cosmic Serpent. It's worth checking out. And, um, mm. you know, quite speculative. So <laughs> keep that in mind. But he, I listened to an interview with him once and he talked about the degree to which he hated cocaine. And it st- sticks with me because... You know, I'm also pretty passionate about environmental issues and, and environmental destruction in the Amazon and like Colombian rainforests. Just people are torching the rainforest to have these like grows that work for three months, uh, and then the government would come trash them. So, like, does Jeremy Narby hate cocaine or does he hate the drug war that forces these conditions in place? Like, I believe, just like what you're saying, there could be like fair trade cocaine that would no longer be thrashing this one of the most valuable resources we as a species has on the planet which is these rainforests amazingly ancient rainforests with so much amazing stuff in there and you know i I hate to say like legalize cocaine but it's it's the drug war it's not necessarily like legalizing the thing it's the drug war that's causing the situation that we're we're suffering through yeah this may be a an instance sort of metaphor but you know, if we if we made, for instance, uh, high fructose corn syrup illegal <laughs> because it's killing so many people through diabetes and all the rest, we wouldn't thus demonize corn because corn is a it's a sacred food and an important food and, and developed within indigenous communities. And cocaine is actually the molecule within the plant, the coca plant, and and it too has been revered for thousands years and, and used respectfully and and just because the western sort of mentality of of extracting and and sort of uh, manipulating that compound you know we shouldn't thus uh, completely throw the viability of cocaine uh, the coca plant uh, completely under the bus because in some ways it is tragic that we only have one sort of socially acceptable stimulant in society caffeine which we're highly addicted to, and oh, yeah. also developed. And yeah, you know that we we should really sort of go back and, and recognize that there are so many people in Colombia and other um, South American countries that depend on on the coca plant for their livelihoods, and and I, I like the idea very much of the fair trade and bringing out into light and educating on how to use it properly, and you know. Tobacco is another one. Tobacco is one of the most sacred plants of Native American communities, and it actually underlies, and uh, Kat Harrison talks about this very eloquently, that tobacco underlies almost all the major psychedelic medicine traditions. Peyote, mushrooms, and ayahuasca, you'll find tobacco as as a core sacrament that is foundational to those medicine traditions. And in the West, we have no healthy relationship to tobacco. It's, you know, tobacco is seen as a, as a sin, as a, you know, as a dire health um, sort of scourge. And we, you know, we need to develop, redevelop healthy relationships to these plants. And yeah, they can be, they can be dangerous and risky, but that's where relationship is where we respect those edges. So actually, um, you know, River Sticks is, is looking into how to, um, to help put a lot of these plant medicines back into a place of honor and respect. So we're, we're actively looking at opportunities to work with Native communities around their sacred tobacco um, and bringing that forward in a good way. And I've been looking for years to try to find a way into the um, the coca conversation and haven't yet found that sort of that leverage point, but we are still looking. It's a hard one, but I, I applaud that effort. Um, so we've talked a lot about harm reduction generally, but a lot of these talk tracks we're having right here around kind of demonized, stigmatized substances can apply to the psychedelic world as well. So because we can't talk about underground facilitators that people go to publicly. We can't talk about the myriad harms that could come from that, from from rape to uh, really poor quality drugs and medicines and 
you know, all sorts of other concerns, even like uh, drug testing at festivals with this uh, 2,5-I N-bomb compound that goes around being sold as LSD and can kill a lot of people and does. And um, only be, only on account of money and only on account of a lack of drug testing. So there's there's a number of avenues that, that do also impact um, the psychedelic space. So folks, you know, think about your own personal use, people you know, and just know that psychedelic use isn't inherently safe. There's a lot of risks in the psychedelic space. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you naming that. And I, I think it's important that we all hold both sides of this. And, you know, that's what psychedelics um, generally are asking of us in our in our personal lives, to be able to hold the, the, the paradoxes that that a lot of these plant medicines, they're, they're potent and potent healers, but also they, they're not without their, their risks and need to be deeply respected and, and honored in that way. And I, I think the, the Renaissance, you know, does need that consistent humbling and tempering. And you're seeing it with Michael Pollan a little bit following the, the Denver initiative and him sort of trying to just plant that seed and instill that that little bit of cautionary note. And I know he got a lot of pushback for that, but you know, I think that was an attempt to to remind people and to stay grounded, to stay humble and 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 cautious. And you talk to um, some of the the researchers who have been in this a long time, like Roland Griffiths and you know, even even with the most highly, highly sort of controlled settings, I mean, you can't imagine how prescribed and controlled and sort of contained that setting is at Johns Hopkins. They they still run into, you know, pretty extreme states at, at times and no one has ever gotten hurt. But even with the tightest container you know, there can be pretty extreme states to to manage, and I would say there are very few people who are trained to an extent where they can uh, really, really hold extreme states of consciousness when you know when they happen. And uh, even at Hawkins, you know, even, yeah, even at Hawkins. So maybe let's unpack the pollen um, thing before we jump to the the larger peyote conversation we want to have. So. The critiques I heard um, and kind of had myself, I had a strong reaction to that as well. It's mm-hmm. like um, my, my, my kind of jerk reaction was, oh, great. It's cool for you to break the law and get away with it and make millions of dollars off of it. But other folks that want to try mushrooms can still go to jail. Like slick move, Michael Pollan. Like I, I'm pretty mm-hmm. mad. <laughs> like I think, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's, you know, you're this guy that writes for the New Yorker, New York times <laughs> writes bestsellers all the time. It's cool for you to break the law, but not for me. And that's how I took it. I do understand we need to be cautious and we talk about it regularly that you need to be safe, but jail is probably one of the biggest harms that can come from mushrooms at this point and people can be wildly traumatized and you know get HIV get hepatitis and whatever else in jail and it's not the best scene so i i i, I always want to push back on pollen on that um i had some beefs with him on twitter but he i think he ignored me <laughs> he he kind of sensed i wasn't going to let go <laughs> but but i don't know any any comments to like how i laid that out yeah, I you know obviously I I'm not going to speak for no, don't Michael, feel, yeah. but I you know I have truly the the utmost respect for him, and you know I I could deeply imagine that he would not want anyone to be jailed for this, and mm-hmm. he he completely gets that, and you know and lives that, and that's in his heart, and you know he has done more for this movement than almost anyone you know, single-handedly, and obviously he, you know, sort of encapsulated all the research that everyone had been doing for decades and and did it beautifully. But, uh, yeah, I, I think he was probably sensing the pulse of the kind of enthusiasm, I don't want to call it an over-enthusiasm, but <laughs> this is taking off. And I think he needed to put his voice in there and to to add a temper tempering, and cautionary note that was not 
quite in his book or wasn't quite the takeaway of his book. And so I, you know, I applaud him for uh, putting himself out there the first time and then the second time and, you know, kind of reaping the, the bit of a backlash from the psychedelic community. Right. It's, um, you know, it's a tough position. You know, he, he did do a lot, but he, he came in kind of as, as like an outsider and as a result of that, got a lot of really serious negative attention from it. So I do, I do understand um, and totally sympathize with that. Anything more before we jump to this wonderful peyote topic? Um, no, I, I would love to transition to that lovely topic. <laughs> cool. So River Styx has been doing a bunch of interesting work around um, peyote, peyote conservation, and the Native American church. Can you kind of give us a little bit of an overview on that? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, to say that we have been funding the psychedelic research movement for 11 years now. Mm. We've probably put in close to $5 million over these years and, you know, very significantly at MAPS and um, in the Johns Hopkins research unit. And, um, you know, it's just been incredible to see all that taking off. And I've always said, yeah, if, you know, if this thing was completely funded, I would probably continue on elsewhere because I'm, as a philanthropist, I'm always looking for that leading edge. And as you said in the beginning, River Sticks is kind of a quiet player because we, you know, once the thing takes off, the movement takes off, then we're, you know, we've played our part and need to, to keep moving on. And it's just so it happens that in 11 years, we've still been very much needed to fund all this research and, it's just incredible. Again, thanks to Michael Pollan, I think in, in large part that a lot of new funding has has arrived. And, uh, and Tim Ferriss did an incredible, incredible job securing funding for the center at Johns Hopkins. So big applause to those guys and thanks. But, um, you know, I when I first got into this work, I have always known the plight of the Native American peoples. They've always been close to my heart for some reason. And when I first came on board as a philanthropist, I, I tried getting involved and, and couldn't really find an entry point. And when you start looking at all the, the myriad of problems facing Native American communities, it's it can be overwhelming and, and daunting about where to where to start. And so I've just kind of held that, um, I'll just say, in my heart and and haven't really had much traction there. But it was about five years ago, it just came into consciousness around um, the Native American church and my, my dear friend around that time through John Halpern, uh, who had supported the Native American church with some early research. And I know John has kind of received flack in, in, a, in a number of different ways, but he, in the Native American church, he's still sort of regarded as um, a, an important ally because he came out with this early study showing that uh, religious and ceremonial use and regular use of peyote was not harmful. So it was through John and a close friend of mine that they had met the president of the Native American church, uh, Sandor Ironrope, and I got connected to, to Sandor through them and um, was introduced to Native American church ceremony and ways. And, and I knew almost instantly that this was something absolutely remarkable, potent, and precious. And I, it was just instant, instantly clear that I had to play a part in this. However, it was the kind of the one of the most daunting and unclear paths that I've ever ventured into because there was no 501c3 organization. There was no structure. There was not a single other philanthropist who had ever, you know, tried to you know, support in this way. The Native American church has never received philanthropic wow. funding and support before. That's crazy. And not to say that they haven't had you know, a lot of help from organizations like the Native American Rights Fund, which, you know, has been a guardian in so many ways over the years um, and helped actually secure their 
legal protections to, to use peyote, which was threatened in the 90s. That led to the, the referendum amendments, and uh, and now are protected um, by Congress under law. So, <clears throat> you know, it was kind of a dubious and unclear path in the early stages, trying to figure out where I could support this community, and recognizing that there were essentially over a quarter million, up to a half million or more. Native American peoples in the United States who regularly partake in a medicine that we as a white culture are just starting to, you know, really gleam and understand of being incredibly healing and potent. And we're all getting really excited about But these communities have been using it for a long, long time and how, how to support them in the continuance and empowerment of their using a highly potent healing substance to treat communities that have suffered so much. And so this was, this was the core question. And through these steps going into this, I, I came to realize quickly that it, it was actually the question of peyote scarcity and the threat to the peyote populations, that was actually the most important leveraged way to assist these communities. And as a lot of the old timers say, you know, they basically want to be left alone to pray with their medicine. They don't they don't need a lot of a lot of other support nor want a lot of other influence, but they they need help to secure the preservation and conservation of this medicine that they rely so heavily on. And so that was really the, the entry point in this. And I could keep talking, but I'll, I'll pause there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's beautiful so far. Um, it seems like we have a lot less left to talk about. Um, so a talk track um, that we picked up at Psychedelic Science Conference, what was that, 2014 at this point? Maybe, I don't know. I, do you remember what year that was, the last one in Oakland? Uh, uh, t- 2016, I think. That sounds more correct. Yeah. There, there was a native woman presenting on uh, a number of issues in the peyote world, um, in the native American church world. And in particular kind of colonizer slash Caucasian use of peyote impacting, you know, that's not the only impact, but impacting access to peyote in native communities, like you say, over harvesting and scarcity and, it, other issues, including development. She showed videos of new homes going in in Mexico and like core lands where these things are growing and it, horrifying. And a talk track uh, for psychedelics today has become like, is, is there traditional religious use? Is that traditional religious use, at least in supply, impacted by your use as an outsider? Then perhaps don't do it or perhaps find a, a far more acceptable way to do it. And I know there's greenhouse cultivation that works. Perhaps that's what gringos eat. And perhaps the more the more sacred version of peyote, which would be, you know, foraged or, or whatnot, that would be left for Native Americans. And, you know, that's, that's been a talk track that we've been on for a little bit. Um, essentially, mm-hmm. since I saw that track, I wasn't really aware of how scarce peyote was. But desert ecosystems are really slow. Like same... I don't necessarily believe there's a traditional use case for these toads in the Sonoran Desert, but use from mass culture could really make these things go extinct. Deserts go grow back really slowly, and there's a lot of factors there. And so, thank you, thank you for working on that and raising that. Um, I want a quick shout out to Canada. I don't think peyote is scheduled yet in Canada. Wink, wink, folks in Canada. So perhaps greenhouse cultivation is okay there. Uh, and, and I'll let you kind of go a little further on the work you're doing um, from there, unless you have any comments on what I said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we've come to a point of you know really asking of our our white allies and uh, those who want to really respect Native communities um, to especially not take peyote from the Texas or Mexico gardens. Um, the the resources are are scarce, and the Native Americans are are suffering and experiencing that that scarcity. You know, the medicine that they're getting is is really 
small and it's getting more expensive and um, it's not the quality that they are used to. And there are viable alternatives, whether it's using Wachuma, San Pedro, or you know, synthetic, synthetic mescaline is, uh, is much more difficult to access, but you know, pretty it's expensive. A, it's a <laughs> yes, it's for folks that don't know. Too. Yeah, and then you know, beyond the actual peyote, I would say one of the most precious to me, one of the most precious aspects of the Native American Church in this sort of global landscape is that it is an incredibly tight lineage, and there is there is a preciousness in the retention of that cultural purity and it, and it's you know not sort of philosophically against pluralism and the evolution of our uh, ceremonial ways but there is something really really precious in the fact that this has been held tightly and in the mushroom culture with the Mazatex and in ayahuasca those those traditions have been I don't want to say diluted, but there's been so many influences and so many actors and players that have come in to to take those ceremonies and have, you know, sort of brought in all sorts of different influences. It's really difficult to track what are the the ancient original threads for those traditions, and I think as we as we continue to you know, get more and more collectively interested in, in psychedelic medicines, we're going to be looking backwards to figure out how were they originally used. And the Native American church has held those ways very tightly. And the way that they were, you know, practiced, it, practiced 150 years ago by the grandpas and grandmas, it's the exact same ceremony as it is now. You know, they're, they're very, very disciplined, and there's a preciousness in that. And it's important that you know white people don't try to come in and and tweak that ceremony. And to me, my stance has always been: if you want to, if you want to try to get involved in that, to show up and to try to show support and, and show your dedication and commitment to supporting the native peoples and empowering them to hold these ways, and maybe. After enough time, you would be lucky enough to be, you know, to be welcomed in to, you know, to sit in and observe. Maybe they won't even invite you to, to eat peyote, but you know, to show that support and respect and humility that these people have suffered so much. We've taken so much away from them that you know, this is the least that we can do to actually just ensure that they can practice this way. It's been a lot of my approach is just stay out of the way. Like, as you say, the amount of suffering these cultures have gone through and endured is astronomical relative to what we can even really imagine. Um, and we don't read history anymore, so folks don't know. Like, you hear, quote unquote, genocide, but you don't know how brutal that was. It was very ugly. Um, and to feel that and to hold that as like a, you know, white person in America highly uncomfortable and to see the condition Native American folks are living in the U.S. at this point in history is highly horrific. Like I, <laughs> some of these reservations are stuff nightmares are made of and how do you yeah, even thank you. touch that? You know? Yeah, thank, thank you for, for naming that. And, you know, we think it's something of the past and, you know, that over, you know, 90% of their populations were, were wiped out from this genocide and disease and all the rest, but no, it's still happening today. The, the average life expectancy of Native Americans is still in the in the fifties. Oh. You know, if, if our life expectancy was only, you know, fifty five in white culture, we would, we would mobilize like crazy to to address those those issues. But you know, maybe it's because we can't we can't face our own shame or guilt that we're not reaching out but you know the 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 problems exist today and those people and those cultures are are very much alive and and they're beautiful they're remarkable people they're incredibly awake sensitive heart open people that have held this precious culture that we romanticize but no they're they're still holding it in their ways 
And to me, the, the peyote work is, as far as I can tell, the highest leveraged way to address the healing that is needed in, in Indian country. Because not only because it's such a potent tool, but also because it's a pan-tribal religion. There, there are dozens and dozens of different tribes all over the country and even in Canada who participate in the Native American church. So through the, the peyote conservation work, it has the potential to reach you know, hundreds of thousands of people, Native Americans all over the country. Right. So one of the, the largest situations in Native American communities, one, one of the many large issues, I, I would say, is alcoholism. And peyote very consistently shows to drop rates of alcoholism. So that in and of itself, empowering communities, making communities healthier is extraordinary. So, you know, there, there are tangible, you know, nameable benefits and that's just one of them, you know, not to mention having a trans tribal religion, which is also ha has myriad tangible benefits. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I understand why it can be difficult for, you know, for philanthropists and supporters to, to come in and help. You know, there's, there's a, a, a deep distrust, I think, across both aisles. And, you know, it takes a lot of time and dedication to show up and, and show that commitment. And, you know, it's taken uh, four years to, to really start building these alliances. And, you know, and yet I would, I would say one of our, our greatest problems is we, we really need funding. We need, we need help. River Sticks and Bronner's um, has essentially been the only you know, the only source of funding so far, and one of the the real things that we're trying to do is to build a, a concerted presence in the peyote gardens in Texas. And one of the biggest steps that we took was to buy 605 acres of peyote land in that area. And you could say, well, you know, how is just six six hundred acres going to solve the peyote crisis? And that was a real concern. It was an expensive piece of land, and it wasn't in itself going to solve the crisis. But it's opened up things like I never could have imagined. You know, on on a tangible level, it's given a sort of street cred amongst the other ranchers down there. So now they're talking to us. They're really interested in providing um, lease agreements to those lands. So we're in conversation with ranchers to procure over 12,000 acres wow. of peyote land that can be Incredible. managed in a conservation way for, the, for that medicine to be harvested with a conservation plan in mind and harvested in a, in a spiritually sound way for the Native American communities. So a lot of this is really trying to return sovereignty and control of the peyote gardens to the Native American communities. And previously, they had little to no access to the land down there. And one of the most beautiful moments for me was actually after we had purchased this land, um, we had a pilgrimage for the Navajo people to come to the land. And there was over 100 Navajo there. And I took this, this Navajo grandmother who was probably in her 80s or even 90s and we I drove her up to the to the medicine uh, where it was and it was one of the I think the first time in her life having prayed with this medicine to actually oh. be with the peyote and the medicine in the ground where it grows and watching her pray to it and connect to it and that that is just completely invaluable mm. this medicine is like it's like God to them. It is God. It is their access to to that healing and to that spiritual realm. And for them to have a safe place where they can come and commune and pilgrimage and pray to the medicine is remarkable. And, it, and it's such a gift. And, and just seeing the reverberations across the Native American church community nationally, that there's this real sense of hope that uh, that they'll be able to be reconnected to to the sacred medicine and so we're you know we're looking at a lot of different avenues for for addressing conservation we're uh, in talks with the 
the DEA now and to get licensed to, to do some experimental cultivation work because it's, I mean, this will probably get you angry too, that it's not legal for Native Americans who have a right to use peyote to actually work with the seeds Unreal. of peyote, <laughs> put the seeds in the ground. Uh and so we're yeah. really trying to open that up and change the culture down there where we can have Native Americans managing the, the peyote gardens um, from a conservation perspective and how it's harvested, but also replanting and putting back two peyotes for everyone that's taken. So uh, in terms of experimental, does that just mean like kind of pilot studies on, on growing at kind of a, a, any kind of a substantial scale or... Okay, cool. That's great. I I yeah. do know, like, there's been talk of, um, and I don't know that this would be appropriate for Native American church folks, but um, grafting peyote onto other cactuses and wildly amplifying growth rates. Um, you may or may not have heard about that, but that, that uh-huh. seems like a really wild thing that might be explored for, you know, non-NAC folks or NAC folks that aren't too sensitive. You know, I'm sure in the Catholic Church, there's people that buy their wafers off of Amazon. You know, so like yeah. perhaps there's a plethora of avenues, but I just wanted to throw it out there. Yeah, it's it's a really it's a really interesting thing because you know the the Native American Church could be criticized at times by I'll just say a certain naive white perspective that they are you know too rigid in their ways. <laughs> and I and I and I think this is probably one of the core criticisms, uh, just generally of Native Americans, that they resisted acculturation, they resisted assimilation. Why couldn't they just be a part of white society? And that's the problem. And that was their, unbelievable that people would say that, but that's your you know, spot that's on. Their, yeah, that's their greatest. That's their strength. That's their holding right. on to precious and they've had to hold on so tight and and i can't even believe they were they were able to in terms of what they were facing but you know now with the the peyote work you know people can say oh well why why don't you just why don't they just use san pedro which is much faster growing or why don't they just (laughs) use mescaline or find another medicine peyote takes too long unreal to say and they they don't they don't understand that this was a relationship with this particular plant that is so sacred and so special. And, you know, it's in holding that integrity and that fortitude and holding that boundary, you know, that's why the Native American church has been able to retain its integrity as, as, a, as a ceremonial practice and way. But it's also pushed us to have to go down and make these kind of relationships with the ranchers. It's forced us to have to to purchase this land, which has opened up this whole other avenue of, of reconnection and pilgrimage that we never could have imagined how, how valuable that is. And that wouldn't have happened if the Native American church didn't draw such a profound line in the sand and say, no, no, it's the peyote. The peyote can't be manipulated. This is a sacred plant. And there's there's not a workaround. So we we have to find ways to uh, to work with this plant and medicine and people uh, for it to be conserved and sustained in its own way and it's in its own right right so developing that kind of like agriculture garden relationship is going to have to be really informed by their their attitudes towards you know how to how do we steward the land and they have to have a hand in it Completely, yeah. So the the Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative is the name of the organization. And Indigenous is the first word very intentionally because the Native American people are leading this. We, the white allies in River Sticks, we're behind them at every step of the way. But we have to take their, their guidance and leadership because if we were to overstep and not be in just fundamental collaboration on this they would they would stop working with us so the relationship is that is that tenuous that we we have to be in you know fundamental 
collaboration and uh, and taking their leadership. And it's you know it's not easy for philanthropists who want you know want things their way and they want things to move at their pace. But this is the only way that we can start rebuilding bridges and, and, and lend healing support for Native American communities. We, we have to be patient and, and, and humble and, and honest, you know, building, building that trusted relationship to, to the extent that they can, you know, receive our inputs as well. Yeah, that's extraordinary. And you hit, I think, all the all the right talk tracks there because I'm sure you live this every day. You're talk, you're in communication with other philanthrop- philanthropic organizations and philanthropists, I assume, to to like talk about this stuff once in a while. Oh, we we are really trying, and um, I imagine over time, just as it's taken, you know, eleven years of funding the psychedelic movement to, to getting to this point where philanthropists are running at this now and you know it will probably take time for people to to see the importance of working with the native communities in this way but yeah i i think that i I just really hope other philanthropists can see the way that this is so essential and that these communities have been working with this medicine and have their own tradition uh, for you know, for centuries before us. And it's, it's precious and there's a huge healing opportunity. So, um, you know, I just, uh, it's a, just a plea for other funders and philanthropists listening to this as well to, you know, to join with us. You know, it's needed, this kind of partnership. And it's, and it's an incredible gift as a philanthropist to just to even get to be in this work and to get to be welcomed in and native communities. It's something I never thought could ever be possible in my life to have, you know, to have genuine authentic relationships with these people. I was, um, pretty heavily involved in the permaculture world for a little while. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with that word, but you Mm -hmm. know, permanent agriculture, permanent culture kind of thing. So (laughs) we, I often really fantasized about how can I help native cultures with this? And I never really found a great avenue in, into helping, but it's amazing that you have, and you found that, that great leverage point of empowerment and, you know, reclaiming tradition and, and uh, a number of other angles on the topic. So I really, it's really amazing. Mm, thank you for, for seeing it and getting it. <clears throat> yeah. It's not, it's not easy and it's a really tough topic and, like I, I grew up really revering Native American culture, you know, looking at old photo books, like learning the history. And um, so I've always had, you know, helped natives uh, in, in really high regard. Um, it's just amazing what they were, <laughs> to, like you said, the degree to which they were able to resist with the numbers they had, the resources they had. It's, it's fascinating that they were able to do it to the degree they did and, and amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's a, I hope it's okay that I, I say, but, you know, there is a way in which we romanticize Native cultures and have this sort of historical fantasy. And, you know, and in, in getting to really spend time with them, I, you know, I've seen how, how special the culture still really is and intact and, and how healthy a lot of their traditions really are and the way that they rear their children and, you know, you can see it in their wit, in their humor. It feels like when I'm hanging out with them, they're like running circles around me in terms of how fast they are and how witty. <laughs> <they are. laughs> That's great. Yeah, they're, it's really special work, special people. Cool. Well, we are at about an hour. I'm curious if there's anything else you want to put out, um, how people can follow your work or anything else you might want to put out there. Um, and feel free to, to email me, of course, it's Cody at riverstixfoundation.org and, you know, happy to talk more about the peyote work and yeah, just really appreciate your kind of understanding of the interdisciplinary approach in all of this work that it's not just about psychedelics, but psychedelics are a way of, you know, facing, helping us to face our own shadows and to reconcile them into our lives and you know that's what where we're working broadly you know just you mentioned permaculture 
we're doing a lot of work to advance um, green burial and and composting toilets. Extraordinary. You know, to, to work all at the these fringe areas where we've stigmatized or pushed out death or, or otherwise dirty things that is actually hurting us to push outside of consciousness. And by welcoming it in and welcoming back the people, the drug users, the criminals, the indigenous people, death, all these aspects, when we welcome them back into our lives and into society, we're all benefited. And there's, and there's beauty, like just extraordinary beauty in them. It's healing for us all. So that's my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Cody from the River Sticks Foundation, I really appreciate you joining us on the show. And, you know, perhaps six, 12 months downstream, we can have you on again and do an update. It'd be lovely. Yeah, maybe we'll, um, if you want to take a trip down to the peyote gardens, you're always welcome. That would be great. <laughs> that would be really great. All right. And there you have it, Cody from the River Sticks Foundation. Really hope you enjoyed it and learned something. I, I know I learned plenty recording with Cody there. So stay tuned. Maybe we'll be able to do some more with him in the future. If you like the show and have any questions, maybe email us. Let us know what you thought or leave some feedback on Facebook or iTunes. We've got a really cool Facebook group, Psychedelics Today group. I, I noticed there's about maybe seven posts today um, as I record this. And posts went all over the map. People looking for advice, people uh, sharing news articles and having interesting conversations. So check it out, Psychedelics Today group. And make sure you're subscribed. Subscribe on anything, <laughs> Spotify, iTunes, your podcast app, wherever. We're all over the place. So definitely please subscribe. Everything helps. And for those who don't know, we've got a couple books out there. We've got a psychedelic trip journal and an integration workbook. You can find those at psychedelicstodayshop.com. We've got some really affordable digital options, and you could also pick up a hard copy on Amazon. So if those, that's of interest, check it out. Also some cool t-shirts and whatever else up there. So would love your support and thanks for checking that side out. And we have a cool project going uh, where we're offering some integration services and consulting calls. So if you're interested in that kind of work, hit us up, psychedelics today, email at gmail.com. We can send you some info and you can learn more. So yeah, if that's of interest to you, uh, we're happy to talk. So, you know, consulting, <laughs> consulting's vague, right? But we can go all over the map. You know, some people are trying to get into the business, figure out how to um, find the right folks in the field uh, or just figure out, you know, the right questions to be asking uh, around this material. And we're happy to help. And anything, um, any of these consulting engagements really help the show. So uh, if you're interested, hit us up again, psychedelics today, email at gmail.com. And I think that's it. So this is Joe Moore signing off for Psychedelics Today from Breckenridge, Colorado. I hope to see you all on the next episode.